Part two. Okay, I did remember what Ryan Millet or Skillet or whatever his name was said. And he was accusing me of not believing that the Bible was authoritative and uh, inerrant. Um, I believe translations have been made which are clearly errant. The, the old, and they keep morphing. The NIV and the New Living Translation have morphed over time. Um, for instance, uh, used to have just a heinous interpretation of uh, 2 Corinthians 9 something where it's talking about uh, in NIV of uh, uh, you will be enriched to all liberality it says in the Greek and the King James is faithfully translated there uh, from just what the best words you could select are in a normal English order uh, they made it into you will be made rich in every way which I think possibly deviates from the <laughs> intent of his, uh, health, wealth, you know, <laughs> all these things. So there were things like that implanted in some of these early perversions. of the, and they, They've gradually mutated them and figured out other ways to say things, I guess, to where they aren't so just blatantly false. The uh, first really striking one in the New Living Translation, the Living Bible, was... Uh, the original Living Bible uh, literally translated Genesis 6 as uh, <clears throat> angels looked on the daughters of men and uh, rather than the sons of God, which can mean either people or angels. And as you look at it, people get punished for what happened there, so you figure possibly it's people besides Jesus said in Matthew 19 is it that uh, when we are in the hereafter we will neither be married nor given in marriage uh, but we will be as the angels so to say angels were married seems to contradict that scripture to me anyway there <laughs> are problems in some of the translations where they they either add things omit things or uh, so you can't say it's inerrant in all translations, nor did God try to prevent people from striking up a business venture to create a perverted translation, because you have to change so many things in order to get a copyright and to get the money from your effort. So the NIV was a for-profit venture that uh, is pushed by Zondervan and different sketchy... Uh, well, I started to talk about that in the previous video. The the uh, whole uh, Ashkenazi Jew thing, and we've got you know people with my lineage that are that are um, uh, trying to promote a particular agenda, who invested in uh, things like seminaries to educate pastors in a particular way, and to make sure that their agenda was being driven in that. And I believe that that was all you know because the Rothschild family bankrolled Israel the construction of the Israeli state in the form of Washington, D.C., not in the form of Israel. It's it's a for-profit business structure like Washington, D.C., if you look at how the government is set up in uh, Israel. And um, you've got a huge business venture there that was bankrolled by a, a banking family who has this history of doing things like false flag operation, you know, involvement to get war started and funding both sides of conflicts and that kind of thing and uh, using the leverage they gain from that to gain access to resources and so on when people default on loans or so on but uh, once you get so much money to play with you can make long-term uh, ventures that are just outlandish at times and um, certainly the whole prospect of having a state called Israel so that you can tell Americans that, hey, if you bless Israel, you'll get blessed. So, hey, pour billions in. And look how we've been blessed. They took over our education system. These people, uh, you look at the affiliation of Ivy League school heads, all but one president at Brown University. All but one president for quite a while. As far as I know, uh, it was a black woman for a while, and then they've got another white woman in there who's not affiliated, as far as I know, with the Ashkenazi Jew thing. 
but the um, every other provost and president is every one of the people involved in overseeing the Ivy League schools. They have a very tight reign uh, control. They will not let people of other races or affiliations occupy any of those positions. All the banking heads, same thing. All the media heads, same thing. There's like 19 of them or so that, you know, all fit into that narrow affiliated family ring. And not all the media heads claim to be Ashkenazi Jews. Most of them are. But they're all white Europeans from that same region and uh, obvious affiliations uh, to establish a cabal of control there. And anyway, so we've got, um, you know, these things running through the world. And if you just look at the Bible's definition of what Israel is, then you clearly see, you, you aren't blindsided by this scheme of theirs. You, you don't wind up pouring your money into something hoping you'll get blessed and it winds up cursing you instead. Because it really has been a, a curse to have our children turn to atheism through these institutions that we allowed them to occupy all the positions in. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's just, this is not a blessing, folks. This is, we're, we're being cursed, not blessed, for blessing this entity that has been constructed by the Rothschild banking family. Now, if you read the scripture in context, you would quickly understand that you've got a uh, Israel that, again, is divined in Leviticus 19, Numbers 15, Ezekiel 30, etc., as the people who bear God's fruit. Uh, and you've got people who dwelt in Israel, and if you look at the surrounding things, hey, they participate in doing the same things the Israels were, Israelites were doing, generally, that were outside of the priesthood uh, people, and um, they... Uh, were to be treated as natural born without exception. There was no birthright, Israel, uh, you're not one of them kind of thing going on. <laughs> they were to be treated as if they were natural born, which means they had to be assigned to a tribe, which means they were, you know, uh, following the same law that uh, the people in Israel followed. And because they're bearing his fruit, then they are treated as natural born. They are having the same blessing as those who uh, would dwell in Israel by birth and choose to do God's law. Now, if you were in there by birth and choose not to obey God's law, law you wound up being outcast, stoned, possibly at least thrown out of the camp. And uh, Romans 11 recaps that whole concept and talks about it as a tree that's having its branches cut off and thrown aside and other branches that are bearing his fruit grafted in and so they can draw from the source of the tree. Uh, the root of um, the tree being uh, God, the, the source of all the, that uh, comes into the branches for nutrient. Now, so you've got... Um, a um, huge misunderstanding and a lot of that. I think it's it's promoted by these, uh, there was a guy named Darby and he was heavily influential in the thinking in Dallas Seminary related seminaries uh, that were funded by these people. And uh, they like to throw out the term replacement theology and in reality if you understand the foundation of what Israel is, there's nothing replaced at all. It's those who are bearing his fruit, those who are bearing his fruit. That's it. That's the only real Israel. Once you aren't bearing his fruit, whether it's Old Testament or New, you wind up being outcast from Israel. You are uh, set outside of the camp. and. Uh, they failed to implement that and let it become a polluted entity, but that's beside the point. That was man's failure across the board. It became a completely diluted entity to where they didn't get any profits for even 200 years. God just cut off the nation and let it uh, flounder until Christ came in the midst of their despair. Uh, though they thought they were rich, perhaps they were naked, blind, and poor. And... Um, so, anyway, this lays our foundation for understanding 
uh, of some very important things and why we can't trust man's uh, seminaries that the argument from authority fallacy of logic applies here uh, the argument from popularity applies <laughs> certainly We've got a lot of popular doctrines and one of those is uh, Calvinism, which I'll talk about next. I think it's centrally the most destructive uh, philosophy that's been introduced and uh, is adhered to by mass numbers of people now. And uh, Calvin had some things that were centered to say, but he, Tulip, the total depravity, and so on, is, um, I can go through each of those. I get a fact I just post usually. and and show the scriptural framework and why each one of them it fails and uh, we'll talk about that in the next video so let's see anything else we want to cover in this one that ties together a bunch of loose ends uh, the guy uh, Ryan I was talking about accusing me of not believing the Bible is uh, infallible no it certainly is infallible in the original language it is what it it was written down in the original languages uh, and uh, then began going through translation and the spirit leads into all truth and we wouldn't know what is true and what is false without the Holy Spirit I mean it would just be some man telling us you believe this this is God's Word I mean, you know maybe it is maybe it isn't <laughs> if and certainly uh, a lot of people claim to be God's orator of truth and they prove not to be because they logically uh, defeat their own argument, <laughs> typically. Uh, they logically contradict themselves or post a circular reasoning argument uh, of some sort. And um, I'll, I'll just talk about that one more, the, the Trinity. We had a, a classical circular reasoning argument going with the guy on the Trinity the other day. This one is, is good to think about. Let's. Um, pause to do that at the end of this video. So we've got um, a guy saying that he's posting me a link to a, a site that was making a long, long argument about stuff I already agreed with, and then it got to what I didn't agree with, which was that, that point one, the big point regarding their interpretation of the Trinity, um, was that... Um, the articles, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and so on, had to be referring to distinct entities because that's the way it's used in the language. Now, the problem is this is a circular argument because you're assuming that the Father is an entity and not an attribute. Father is an attribute name. <laughs> I mean, it's the most silly but it's just so common that people fall into it left and right it's the most common fallacy of presuming that we're talking about an entity therefore it has to be an entity <laughs> the the father is an attribute name and there is nothing in the bible that really distinguishes holy spirit and father as separate entities i mean god is spirit singular not spirits uh john says and um, that means a, like a vapor, something we can't fully perceive, something we can't fully understand, the, don't know where it goes, where it comes from necessarily, but we sense there's something there. It, it is ill-defined to us. It's complex. It's like a mist, something we can't, you know, identify and, uh, as to specifically what it is necessarily. Uh, the um, Holy Spirit is just, you know, something that can, Jesus had to leave, and this often confuses people, in that he could send it to us. Well, now, people like David had the Holy Spirit. It says, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So he experienced a relationship with the Holy Spirit in Psalm 51. Um, these particular people, you've got to understand that this is talking about in scripture and this is another very important uh, point and especially when we're reading Paul's scriptures uh, regarding better that you not marry 
well, in the beginning, it was better that you do marry, and that's why God made Eve. <laughs> so this is not good for a man to be alone. Uh, for these particular people who had just come to Christ, it was better that they not marry, uh, because they needed to sort out their own relationship with God and for throwing in another factor to turbulate the whole situation, and they didn't have the discernment anyway by that point. Uh, they needed to mature uh, to even know who would be a person that God would have them with. They would just be responding by appearance, making appearance judgments. Uh, and that's why Paul told them it's better for you not to marry. Anyway, back to the previous point about uh, the Trinity thing. So we've got um, the articles, you know, pointing to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Son, again, an attribute name, uh, in that uh, God lowered himself to the form of a servant, Paul says. He lowered himself to the form of a servant. That was not his previous form to be in a fleshly body. He didn't need an earthly dwelling, it says, and again in First Chronicles 17. He didn't need that uh, earthly house to house his spirit, but he took it on for our benefit, lowered himself to the form of a servant for our benefit. So this is not his native, it's not an eternal body of Christ floating around in outer space or whatever. The, the concept of doing it, God had uh, before he created man, no doubt. Um, but he didn't have need for the physical body until the time came to plant that seed in Mary, and then the body began to grow in Mary, uh, with a custom genetic form, we assume, <laughs> since uh, there was no hu uh, human DNA involved from the other side, and God constructed whatever he wanted to come out in that he would have an appearance that did not draw us to him. Uh, I suspect very possibly that Jesus was a... Uh, different looking person than the people in his region and people tend to be attracted to people that look like themselves and think that they look superior so that's very possibly what that Isaiah verse is referring to I won't stick to it like you know that's the only possibility but it certainly seems likely uh, given that uh, people do tend to prejudice other people's appearance if they don't look somewhat like themselves, and there was nothing about his appearance that would draw us to him. Maybe maybe he uh, intentionally made him look different, and that would make people wonder, hey, how did Mary wind up, you know, does she know somebody that would have made a baby that looks like that? It's kind of an interesting proposition, huh? And uh, would plant seeds in their mind that maybe God did immaculately conceive this in Mary. And, um, so, uh, anyway, we've got these attribute names of the Spirit and the Father, and then the Holy Spirit. God is the only one that's holy, and God is Spirit, so Holy Spirit is his most fundamental attribute name. So these attributes of God immerse people into the character or the expressed attributes of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the argument really goes nowhere in establishing whether these are attributes or whether these are persons, as the uh, Nicene Council presumed upon us <laughs> and got the dictionary definition changed for person to include that definition. Because uh, certainly God isn't three men, God isn't like three men. <laughs> And um, God did appear as one man who had a soul, spirit, and uh, physical body in Christ, but that wasn't his native form again. He was Lord of that form. So, so there's um, another segment of um, thought. I guess we'll do the uh, Calvinism one next. I'll uh, go ahead and stop here.